that uh, today we have a concluding event, the last meeting or seminar, but I can already say that this project was quite fruitful and productive, at least as how we see it. As far as I know, approximately 10 documents were published, plus uh, blogs, this, uh, expert opinions, memos, and uh, many discussions were held too. So why did we want and were interested in funding this uh, project? We and many other donors, NGOs, analytical centers, media groups, study, um, far right and uh, nationalist uh, groups that uh, actually multiplied in Georgia during the recent times, but we've seen that there was no coordination, if you will, between the researchers and other groups, and everybody was trying to choose their own area of focus, and there was no exchange of information. And this is why discussions which basically created the platform for people interested in these issues and uh, and for exchanging these interesting ideas. I think it was a very good thing to do. Today we have the ninth discussion and the concluding one. So in this last year, it didn't look like a very pressing issues, these far-right uh, groups and their uh, narratives, because we had to face some other problems and challenges. But again, a new political party has been created, led by Levan Basadze. It's hard to analyze and speak about perspectives of that party, but he's seen the possibilities and options of uh, creating a new party. Uh, so there are two dramatic events um, that the country faced, the crisis and the pandemic, and the crisis that developed after the election. So in my opinion, those groups uh, were visible on one side in, in the area of pandemic, but they haven't been visible in the area of crisis. And that's quite interesting, I think. And in one of the meetings, we have analyzed it too. Now, as to pandemic, we have see, we've seen the various conspiracy theories in Kernan and of course the Russian propaganda amplified it too. And we've seen many different uh, conspiracy theories about the vaccines and, uh, and other directions or uh, regarding decisions taken by the state. As to the elections process and the post elections crisis, although we're all afraid that in Georgia we have quite a fruitful soil for conservative ideologies and, uh, and we have a strong influence of the Orthodox Christian Church, which supports that too, from a literal point of view, we can say that the groups and the political parties that have been created right before elections basically failed, although it's not the subject uh, to relaxation, so to say, and so we cannot say that they don't have any future. Uh, the in-depth analysis will be made during the meeting, and therefore I will not go deeper. For me, it's important that the Georgian Institute of Polit uh, Politics uh, tries to draw parallels with European trends. And uh, indeed, there are similarities in terms of instruments or messages, although there must be differences too. And I'm sure that these issues will be mentioned as well. It is it's very interesting for me to listen and to see why we are in this paradoxical situation where on the one hand, these groups have support, but they fail um, in, in elections. So I want to wish you all a success and I will thoroughly and carefully listen to everything that will be said today. And thank you to Corneli for organizing such an interesting meeting. Thank you. Thank you, dear Katie. Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the Jordan Institute of Politics, thank you.
you for the interest in this event. First of all, I would like to continue the topic that um, is getting started why it is so important. And I must say that uh, at one time we thought that maybe this topic is not really relevant, but recent developments showed and clearly demonstrated that this problem is permanently with us and we have to face the reality and see the research is the truth that a big part of voters, big segment of voters, is basically a supporter of political parties of movements like that. Therefore, in times where in country the uh, processes of approximation to Europe have started and we understand that this is the long-term process, then seeing this uh, in liberal uh, trends, uh, we really have to see what the reasons are and analyze uh, these things. and. European countries also have uh, some problems as well as many other countries of the world and uh, we as our country don't have luxury not to, uh, to discard these issues uh, and uh, of course uh, considering challenges that the country faces we need to really focus on such issues. I want to thank the uh, this uh, Open Science Foundation for being interested in this for funding this project and we of course have tried to create some foundations some grounds we had publications which are quite popular among students in different universities as far as i know they use them for bachelor's degrees papers or master's degrees papers um, Georgia, of course, will not, wouldn't be able to survive this wave of populism that is so widespread in the world. So this is as a small intro. We will have two panels that it has been announced. I am the moderator for the first one. Uh, would like to... Uh, introduce to you Professor Kas Mude, and I would like to thank him for participating in this event, for finding time despite his extremely busy schedule. And despite this time difference between uh, US and uh, Georgia, for us, his participation is absolutely crucial because he's one of the prominent researchers of uh, populism and radical extremism, therefore, for our concluding event, we definitely wanted him to participate. So thank you, Professor, once again. Also, I would like to briefly introduce Professor, maybe many of you know him, but people who have this uh, political science background, you would know him as this uh, from the University of Georgia, Associated Professor. He is also the uh, Affiliated Professor of the Oslo University on Extremism. His researches are focused on extremism and populism in Europe and America. Professor is also the European politics expert and Western democracies, uh, far right uh, uh, movements uh, expert. He uh, covers many different areas of research. And one of the questions that he tries to answer is how to uh, uh, can the national democracies protect themselves uh, from extremism without um, being somehow damaged? I also have to mention that he was a co-founder of the research group of extremism. He has lots of different publications on the topic and uh, his recent paper is very uh, popular and the uh, the name of that in Georgia was like the Barad movement today. It is translated into many languages and I hope it will be translated into Georgian as well. So this is very briefly uh, about the biography of our uh, professor. So I would like to pass floor to him and I can start his welcoming remarks and the keynote speech, please, so, Professor. 
Thank you very much for having me. Um, it is a it is a pleasure to speak from the state of Georgia to the country of Georgia. Um, I haven't done that yet. So you might have seen this actually that in the insurrection on January 6th, um, there was actually one of the Trump supporters had a flag of the country of Georgia, um, which could only be seen as someone who had like mistaken the US state of Georgia for um, the country of Georgia, which says you, tells you something about who was protesting. <clears throat> now I have a very little time for an academic. So what I want to do is go very rapidly through some key terminology and then talk to you about where we are today, which I call the fourth wave. I will define what the key characteristics are and what the key consequences are. And everything else you can ask me in the q and <clears throat> So first of all, when I talk about the far right, I talk about groups that are anti-egalitarian, right? Left-right distinction for me is between whether you see inequalities in society as natural or unnatural. The right sees inequalities within society as natural and outside of the purvey of the state. So they don't want the state to equalize society. Now, not all of the right are part of the far right. <clears throat> what we generally call the mainstream right are, are parties that believe in natural inequalities, but also support liberal democracy. And I will say a little bit more about that. The far right is that part of the right that does not believe in liberal democracy. There are two major groups, the extreme right and the radical right. The extreme right does not believe in democracy per se, which means they do not believe in popular sovereignty and majority rule. Think about fascism. <clears throat> so they fundamentally believe that people should not elect their leaders. While there are some extreme right parties today, think about Golden Dawn in Greece, the vast majority of more successful political parties today <clears throat> are radical right. So they believe in natural inequalities. They do believe in democracy the idea that people elect their own leaders, but they do not believe in liberal democracy. And liberal democracy combines popular sovereignty and majority rule with um, minority rights, rule of law, separation of powers. And so the radical right <clears throat> does not believe in those aspects. Now, most of the radical right today is what I have called populist radical right, which means that they combine three different features. <clears throat> First, nativism, which is, a which is a combination of xenophobia and nationalism. And so very simply stated, it, it was um, this infamous slogan from the early 1990s in Germany, <clears throat> where people were shouting, Germany for the Germans, foreigners out. That is the core of nativism. So, in Georgia, that would be Georgia for the Georgians, foreigners. Out. Authoritarianism, I do not mean as an anti-democratic system, but more in a social psychological uh, understanding where you believe that the natural state is chaos and the, the state has to enforce discipline and order. Authoritarians see everything as pretty much a law and order issue. Drugs is not an issue of, of uh, uh, individual needs or trauma. It's just a matter of enforcing the law stricter. And so authoritarians want schools to instill discipline in children. And they want to have very strict laws and very strict enforcement of laws. And finally, populism, um, which I see as an ideology which sees society as ultimately divided between two groups, which are um, both um, 
homogenous and antagonistic, the pure people and the corrupt elite. And they want politics to be in line with what they believe is the general will of the people. So populists believe like, that the people, all of them share exactly the same interest and have the same values. And that all of the elite, be they social Democrat, Christian Democrat, whatever, they're all essentially corrupt. So that is the key distinction. It's not about whether you have money or your class. It's about whether you're so-called pure of soul or corrupt. <laughs> now, the German political scientist Klaus von Beimer distinguished three waves of what he called post-war right-wing extremism in Western Europe. The first wave was roughly 1945, 1955, which he called neo-fascism. These were just the remnants of the fascist regimes of the Second World War. And most of them were not really active in political parties, in part because many countries had banned <clears throat> neo-fascist parties. The only real exception was the Italian social movement, the MSI in Italy. The second wave that he distinguished, he called right-wing populism, which was roughly 1955, 1980. It was fairly diffuse. It was mostly movements um, and so-called flash parties, parties that came out of nowhere and disappeared after one or two elections that opposed the dominant model, be that urbanization in France or welfare state in Denmark and Norway. And then in the 1980s started the third wave, which brought us largely the parties that many are still around. Think about the Swiss People's Party, Austrian Freedom Party, the Flemish bloc, now Flemish interest. And his argument was that this wave was a response to both unemployment, but mostly to immigration. Now, my argument is that at the turn of the century, a fourth wave started, which was mostly a consequence of long ongoing structural changes, as well as the, uh, the attacks of 9-11, which kind of were a catalyst to moving <clears throat> the politics to the right and also moving politics from focused on socioeconomic issues to social cultural issues. This fourth wave knows many of the same parties of the third wave, but <clears throat> there is a fundamental difference in the way that they relate to their broader environment. So first of all, the fourth wave is characterized by extreme heterogeneity. Um, even if you look just at the party aspect of it, the electoral aspect of it, you have <clears throat> presidents like Bolsonaro and Trump who are elected, who are far right, but are elected to power on the ticket of a party that is not perceived as far right, or at least in 2016, that was the case in the US. You have political parties that have only one member, like the Party for Freedom in the Netherlands. And then you have the largest political party in the world, the BJP in India, with 180 million members, allegedly. Like you have parties that are only a few years old, like Chega in Portugal, and you have parties that date back to the 1950s. You have parties with a phenomenal organization and parties that are not more than just a few members and a leader. So there's extreme heterogeneity. The far right today is also global. Like it's no longer the case of just Western Europe or Eastern Europe, it's now in the US. It's in Brazil, it's in Israel, it's in India, and it's in other countries. But I think what sets it apart more in terms of how it is, how it relates to the political context, is that in the third wave, the, the far right, at that time the radical right, were challengers to the system. They were kind of outside of the system, trying to break into parliament, and some of them tried to be in government, but most didn't. They just wanted to get in. They, they saw themselves as outside of the system, unconnected to the mainstream. 
in Western Europe before 2000, the year 2000, there was only one government that actually had a radical right party in it, which was the Berlusconi government of 1994 in, in Italy. Now today, a majority of EU countries has had or has a radical right party in a coalition, be it at the, at the national or at the regional level. Right? So the radical right has become mainstreamed in two ways. Its ideas have become mainstreamed and are now shared by mainstream parties. And their parties have become mainstreamed and are now seen as what is called coalitions fake or <clears throat> um, acceptable for coalitions. Even if they don't actually enter the coalition, they are considered as potential coalition partners in most European countries. But it has gone even further. They have become normalized. And the difference between mainstreaming and normalization is that mainstreaming is more an empirical process. Like it's where the most of the politicians are. That's where the mainstream are to a certain extent. Normalization is a normative process. And a lot of the points that the radical right made in the 80s and 90s and that were excluded from the political debate are now seen as common sense, like as beyond, um, as beyond ideological. So for example, the idea that immigration or Islam is a threat to national identity and national security, like, is now considered common sense. If you challenge that, like people think that you're some kind of weirdo. <clears throat> um, we also see it in the type of support that radical right position, positions or people get. For example, the Wall Street Journal, the opinion page endorsed Bolsonaro for the election. Uh, we see in many mainstream newspapers, we see op-eds by far-right leaders. Uh, various newspapers have columnists who are of the radical right. And when you challenge media, uh, they will say, well, they're just part, they're just a normal part of politics. The consequence of all of this, which I think is very important and still not really acknowledged enough, is that we have shifting boundaries. In the 1980s, 1990s, it was pretty easy to see who was in the radical right and who was a conservative party, who was a mainstream right party. There were different worlds. Um, even though some parties took up a more critical position on immigration, it was still very clear what was <clears throat> the neo gaullist party in France and what was the Front National in France. If you look today at these parties, and you look at the Republicans versus the national rally in France, right, they're almost interchangeable on many positions. Like, where is the Republican party in the United States? Where is the conservative party in the UK? <clears throat> A lot of parties, have become so similar to the radical right that it is that it is really no longer that easy that what von Beimer wrote in 1988 is well we might not be able to define them but we know who they are you cannot say that anymore by the basis of the criteria that we used in the 1980s or 1990s for example a large group of mainstream parties would now be considered radical right because they're so critical about immigration and integration <clears throat> that they would definitely, if they would have made those statements in the 80s, 1990s, everyone would have said that's a nativist party. Where does that lead us today? I think, first of all, we have to rethink the far right and rethink the threat of the far right. Let's be clear, the far right is a threat to liberal democracy. Right, the extreme right is pretty clear. They're against democracy as such. Um, they are often also more willing to use violence. 
But in the vast majority of countries, the extreme right is relatively marginal. The radical right plays the parliamentary game, but wants to undermine basic protections of minorities, not just ethnic or religious minorities, political minorities, because they believe that anyone who doesn't think like them is part of the corrupt elite. And because your opponent is corrupt, he's not just your opponent, he's your enemy. Like, they want to undermine everything you stand for. Consequently, they don't deserve protections under rule of law. They don't deserve minority rights. And where that leads to is what we can see in Hungary. Right? In Hungary, Vic Viktor Orban came to power in 2010, came back to power in 2010, selling himself as kind of a national conservative, radicalizing pretty rapidly, and completely dismantling liberal democracy. Um, to the extent that now many organizations no longer consider Hungary even a democracy. <clears throat> I think what, what we should see is two things. First of all, the radical right, even if they play seemingly according to the game, they want to change the rules of the game and as a consequence, the game. Second of all, radical right policies do not only come anymore from radical right parties. They now come also from mainstream parties. And the struggle should not be limited to the struggle against the radical right. The problem is not necessarily the parties, the problem are the policies, irrespective of who implement them. In Denmark, for example, it is the Social Democratic Party, a center left party, that at the moment <clears throat> tries to expel Syrian refugees because they have deemed Damascus to be safe. Like, they have one of the strictest immigration policies in Europe. It doesn't make it less radical right, less nativist, just because it is a in name social democratic party that does it. And so I think the struggle is on two fronts and we have focused too much on the one front. We have kind of said everything radical right parties do is bad. Even though quite a lot of the things are within the framework of liberal democracy. And at the same time, we have said everything a mainstream party does is good because it's not a radical right party, even though quite a lot of nativism and authoritarianism and to a certain extent populism is coming from the mainstream today. I'll leave it at that and look forward to your question. Thank you, Professor, for this interesting uh, speech. Uh, I think we have questions to you, but before we move on to questions, I would like to um, mention it cite him. He said that it's you said that it's a uh, right parties they had the challenge for liberal democracies, and it is so indeed. And not only established liberal de de democracies, but non consolidated democracies to uh, the countries of Georgia and the Eastern Partnership. So I wanted to ask you a question. You said that not only far right groups. Uh, but uh, this uh, wave of populism uh, was spread over the uh, left uh, parties, etc. So what is the role of traditional parties with regard to these uh, far-right parties? And I am asking it because you probably know that in some European countries, this uh, uh, traditional uh, rightist parties, they are really concerned and they are thinking what can they do, say, in Germany or other countries to re-attract the lost voters, uh, the voters who became supportive of uh, ultra-right uh, parties. And sometimes we would even hear them say that maybe it's time for, for us as right parties 
to move even further right uh, to regain the voters that the ultra-right parties uh, you know deprived us from do you think this uh, thinking is right pragmatic uh, are there any risks or will it bring any success to traditional parties in this competitive struggle uh, and fight with these radical groups? Thank you. Well, I think what we have seen over the last decades is that a lot of mainstream parties are far more concerned with surviving themselves than uh, having liberal democracy survive. Um, there, so the question is really two questions like one is what can social democratic parties do to survive or what can conservative parties do to survive how can they fight off the competition by the radical right now to be honest for me that is of no concern because i don't work for those parties my concern is first and foremost liberal democracy and so <clears throat> there is some evidence that center-right parties can be successful by adopting much of the agenda of the radical right. There's much less evidence that center-left parties can do that too. But if you look at a party like Conservative Party in Britain or the Austrian Freedom, uh, the sorry, the Austrian People's Party of Sebastian Kurz, they seem to have been very successful in adopting co-opting much of the agenda of the of the radical right and doing really well in the polls at the same time both of them are <clears throat> undermining certain elements of the rule of law and of minority rights and sometimes separation of power so what what does that help liberal democracy like for liberal democracy it doesn't matter whether it is so-called mainstream parties that undermine them or radical right parties. Um, so I think that there should, there should be, for the question of what can mainstream parties do, I think the question should be, what can mainstream parties do to strengthen liberal democracy? The question is not what can they do to strengthen themselves, because that could lead to pretty much becoming a radical right party yourself. Um, <clears throat> and that doesn't help liberal democracy in anything. Um, I think that the key thing that they can do is come up with a comprehensive ideological program again. To a large extent, radical right parties profit from the ideological vacuum that exists within, I would say, the Western politics in general today. We have, we have a, a kind of a neoliberal economic system that almost no one defends anymore. We have a multicultural society that everyone says has failed. Uh, we have a lot of things, European Union, that everyone says is too far from the citizens. Uh, like we need to have people tell us like why we have these systems. And if they don't like them, then we have to come up with a Christian democratic, green, social democratic vision for the future. It's only with an, an alternative ideology that we can start to marginalize the, not just the electoral success of the far right, but also the ideological success of the far right. Thank you, sir. I see several hands raised. And Nino Samkaradze has well, then Teona Zorobashvili, and then Chota Kakabadze, and then we will continue like that. Today, I hope you hear me well. I have the following question. What is the Western experience with regards to the issue where we as Georgia have some sort of experience, the, the competition between far-right parties and how does it work? For instance, in Georgia, 
we have uh, many parties like that. Some of them uh, already have the experience of being members of the parliament. Some of them have quite strong financial resources. Some of them are quite small uh, in size, but uh, still their directions and their ideas are more or less the same or similar. So what is the Western experience uh, with regard to such parties, the competition between them or collaboration between these parties and what can we expect uh, from such competition between those parties? Uh, maybe we could collect several questions and then you could answer what's, what's your preference or maybe we could collect these questions really and then provide answers. All right, Eona. Eona Zorobashvili, junior analyst from the Georgian Institute of Politics. You've mentioned four waves of uh, rightist populism. So I have a question. What can be the perspective and future of such direction of these uh, parties and how long can they preserve relevance in citizens? So these are two questions that we would ask you, Professor, to answer, and then we will continue and collect and collect another two questions. Thank you. The floor is yours, Professor. Thank you. And let me also say what a delight it is that the first questions are from women, which unfortunately doesn't happen very often. Um, so I'm working back um, with the question of, in a sense, what is going to be the fifth wave um, that, that, that Tiona asked me, which, which is interesting because when I wrote the book, I never thought about a fifth wave. And like everyone now asked me about the fifth wave and I thought I was so clever to come up with a fourth wave. Um, so I think that, first of all, the, the radical right is here to stay. Um, it's not going to go away. It's, it might become less relevant in terms of electoral politics, but even that, I'm not so sure. I think more than anything, the next stage is where the radical right is going to be less dominant in the political debate. For the last two decades, they have been very successful in agenda setting, but also in framing the agenda. So they play a disproportionate role in what we talk about, but also how we talk about it. So we talk about immigration, we talk about integration, but we talk about them as problems. We talk about immigration as threat. I think that is something that is, is going to change. I think in the future, we're also not going to only talk about identity issues and security issues. We're going to talk again about issues like work, like education, like healthcare. Um, and so I, I see the fourth wave really as in many ways, um, almost like a hegemonic period for the radical right, which is overselling it a bit, but I think in the future they will be around. They might even be more successful in various countries electorally, but they will be less dominant politically. For the simple reason that most people, yes, they support quite a lot of the positions of the radical right, maybe not as extreme as the radical right, but close to it. They are authoritarian. They have strong anti-establishment sentiments they're very critical towards immigrants and uh, multiculturalism, but they have many other issues that they would like to see discussed too. These don't have much salience for them because no one else talks about them. What we know from political science research, if we talk about certain issues, be that immigration or be that the environment or be that public health, these become important issue to people. So I think that we, we're going to see that in the near future. We're going to see a much more diverse political debate and a much more diverse ideological debate. Now the competition of radical right parties that Nino asked me that, and that's a very interesting question because it's not something that the literature has been busy with much. Um, but actually there are quite a lot of countries 
that do have more than one radical right party, even in government, uh, sorry, well, also in government, but also in parliament. Think about Italy, which has both the brothers of Italy um, and the League. The Netherlands at the moment has three radical right parties in parliament. Um, the first thing I would say is that it's better to have two than to have one because the two will never trust each other in the same way as the one will. And what we see is that, for example, Italy, uh, Greece, there are various countries that have had mostly right-wing populist coalitions where every party was right-wing populist or at least populist. And yet they didn't do that much damage because undermining the state is one thing, but shifting power. So for example, one of the things that populists, including of the right want to do is give the executive much more power. Now in Hungary that happens because there's only one party there, but in a, a coalition, both let's say far right party one and far right party two might want that, but they also both want to control the executive, right? And so party B is not going to give a lot of power to party A. And so even within the same political family of the far right, there will be a lot of distrust. And in that sense, it's better to have <clears throat> two than one radical right party. There is something that also can happen, and you see that very often. It, ha it happens in the Netherlands at the moment, and it leads to more mainstreaming of the radical right. When there are two radical right parties, let alone three, media, pundits, commentators will need to have a more reasonable and radical or moderate one and a more extreme one. And so what happens if you have a neo-Nazi party and you have a radical right party, people are going to refer to the radical right party as moderate. Because compared to the extreme right party, the neo-Nazis, they are much more moderate. But of course, in actual terms, they're still a radical party. And this is something we have to be very careful with. Like the fact that you have an even more dangerous party doesn't mean that everyone else is not dangerous. Um, so I think that is something to, to really look at. You see a shifting of um, the narrative and you see that much more when you have a few radical right parties. Um, and for example, in the Netherlands at the moment, we have three, as I said, one is completely excluded. One is increasingly excluded, and another one, which is almost identical to one of these, is now seen as an acceptable party because they're not as crazy as the other two. Um, even though they stand for roughly the same worldview. So I think that is important to keep an eye on when you have that situation. Thank you, sir. I see that there are many questions accumulated. So we'll try to collect like three questions at a time. And then we also have to remember that we are quite limited in time. So now Ketevan and uh, some others, and then we'll see how much time will be left. So thank you, sir, for this very interesting uh, speech and very interesting answers to questions. Now, when we talk about uh, far-right parties in Georgia, we we usually see the very close relations and connections with Russia, either funding coming for, from Russia or some other ideological links, etc. So can we say that in this fourth wave, Russia has influences globally? Well, is Russia is an, an important factor for this fourth wave? This is one question. Now the second one. Good day. First of all, thank you very much for this interesting speech. I have a very brief question about populism and, uh, and the concept of far right. Do you think 
So when we use this term in academic discussions or media, it always is used in the negative connotation. So uh, can this term be internalized and may it happen that uh, it will be used in a positive way and not only negative so that it's not uh, so it may happen that you know they they will proudly say that they are say far rights and populists or something. The next question we will hear now. All right, then let's give the floor to David Sijinava. Hi, and thank you. My question was very simple. The question is, Professor, what do you think about non-liberal international, this international uh, unions between these parties uh, throughout the world who exchange their own ideas amongst themselves. Like in Georgia, we had, so we have several groups in Georgia and, uh, uh, and uh, these groups perceive Trump or someone like him as politicians from whom they need to learn and use them as samples. So what about this internalization, uh, internationalization? Um, uh, another question. My question is related to something that the David started talking about. I will try to be more specific though in my question. Um, In case of lack uh, of institutional uh, links of communication, and uh, if uh, this is only mentioned by media, what influence these nationalistic uh, parties may have, uh, for instance, on European political um, um, discourse? And one more question, Valeri. All righty then, the, the next uh, question, and let it be the last one. Okay, so let me respond, try to respond to. Yes, I think this this is all we uh, will ask Professor to ask these questions. And if we have then more time, then of course well, we, will, uh, we will give more flow and more time to these questions. If not, then we'll start at our second panel. Okay, we'll try to be quick. Um, I think David's question and Ketavan's question overlap a bit. It's about the international collaboration. Um, so this has always been a lot of speculation about the nationalist international or the brown international or the populist international. Beautiful, beautiful terms for it. Um, in practice, what we see is almost nothing. Um, it is remarkable, actually, to see that at one point in time, like you had India, Brazil, and the United States all led by the far right. And they didn't achieve any significant change in the structure of international politics. Like these are three of the most powerful states. And the reason is simple. They never really work together. Right? Sure, they tweeted nice things about each other and Modi and Trump, 
we're at a rally with one or two, but there is no institutional structure. Uh, Trump was never interested. Bolsonaro is fairly marginal. Modi is not really interested. He prefers to work with general governments, these mainstream parties. And even within the European Parliament, where you have significant financial incentives to work together, far-right parties are <clears throat> currently divided over three different groups, four probably. Um, so as a consequence, their effect on international discourse or international policy is largely indirect. So on the one hand, they have an effect by stopping stuff, which is pretty much um, what Hungary uh, tries to do by vetoing stuff. They just veto <clears throat> some stuff recently. Um, Trump pretty much just withdrew the US from everything, but the institutions remained, right? It just didn't have the US in it, which meant that China played a bigger role in them. Um, so the international, the biggest effect you see actually on European integration, not by the far right within Europe, because they have virtually no power within the European Parliament or within the Commission or within the Council, but indirect. It is their success and the Eurosceptic voice that have made mainstream parties more Eurosceptic, more scared <clears throat> to do things that would advance European integration because they fear that it will lose them to radical right parties. So it, it is all very indirect and it is all very reactionary. Like it's a reaction to, they don't create anything. They just weaken the current structure. Now, what is the role of Russia? Um, I understand that this is a particular sensitive issue in Georgia. Um, there are many, many people who think that Russia is very important. I am not one of them. Um, I'm sure that Russia is more important in what it considers its backyard, just as the US is in its backyard. Right? And so obviously they play a bigger role in Ukraine and undoubtedly in Georgia than they do in Luxembourg. Right? But many of the contemporary radical right party look relatively favorable up in Russia, either because he's against the EU or because um, he's against the, just the dominant order, Putin, in that sense. There are only a small group of relevant radical right party that are truly pro-Putin. It's a misunderstanding. The reason why many are pro-Putin is because they feel that Putin share, shares part of their agenda. But if Marine Le Pen has to choose between what is good for Putin and what is good for France, she is going to choose what is good for France. Right? <clears throat> um, and then there are still significant parties that are very anti-Russian. Right? Law and justice in Poland is, is paranoid about Russia. The Estonians, are, are particularly anti-Russian. And so Russia plays a much bigger role, perhaps than any other country, but it's still a side player. Right? They provide some resources, some discourse, but things like RT, formerly Russia Today, right? No one watches RT anywhere, probably not even in Russia. Right? You see it a lot on social media, but it's not like someone looks at RT and think, oh, the world is this way. No, they already think that it works like that. And then they see a nice clip of RT, which is free and therefore very easy to distribute. So I think we should, we should keep in mind that in almost all cases, the far right is first and foremost a domestic problem. Russia might help exploit weaknesses within societies, but they don't create those weaknesses. We have created those weaknesses ourselves. Um, populism far right as a positive or negative term, I mean, depends on the beholder, right? Um, I personally, in my academic work, consider neither populism nor far right necessarily negative or positive. Like if you don't support liberal democracy, then populism doesn't have to be negative. 
Now, I personally support populism, uh, sorry, support liberal democracy, and therefore, for me, populism is a problem, right? But I also always tell my students, like, I mean, that is my personal normative profile. Um, there is actually quite a lot of people who consider populism to be positive. They often redefine it. Um, I don't. I don't think that this is something that we can control. Like, it, this is. I don't think populism needs to be a derogative term. I think it can be used in an academic sense that it helps us understand the world better. The fact that most people consider it negative at this point in time. I think that's a consequence of the fact that most people consider liberal democracy positive at this point in time. Finally, my favorite question, the role of the media. <clears throat> and I'm going to leave social media out because that's a whole different dis discussion. I believe that the media, and I'm talking about the traditional media, um, should do two things. I mean, if traditional media consider themselves the watchdogs of democracy, which they so often pretend to, to do, then they should make a difference between those groups and parties that support democracy and those that don't. Like, <clears throat> the fact of the matter is independent media cannot exist outside of liberal democracy. It's the only system that guarantees freedom of press. Hence, by definition, any party that challenges that is a problem for you, which means that you treat the radical right and the far right differently. Does that mean that you attack them? Not necessarily, it doesn't help anything. Like negative publicity is still good publicity for most particularly smaller groups. What you should do is give them, this, should give them proportional um, coverage. Don't blow up things just because you think it will sell. Don't make them look bigger than they are. Don't make them look more important than they are. But also don't, don't ignore them. Like if they are representative of an important part of the population, you won't save democracy by ignoring your problems. But you also don't help it by acting as if they are the voice of the people, even though they represent only 5% of the people, which is what the media very often do. I also believe and this is where the difference between democracy and non-democratic actors come in. You don't give platforms to the radical right. There's a difference between writing about them and having given them access to your opinion page. I don't think a democratic newspaper should give space to someone making a non-democratic argument. Um, and so it's there where I draw the line. But the key thing is treat them like for who they are, um, understand them, like don't, don't write easy soft takes on them, but also don't write easy negative takes on them because actually it doesn't help anyone. We don't understand the far right by calling them all neo-Nazis and it doesn't harm them. Like it only harms them when they start to become really relevant. But in the early stage, if you're a small group, the only thing you want is attention. If it's negative attention, it's still attention. Thank you very much, Professor. I think we still have a little bit of time for some questions. So, um, so Nino, uh, is, I think it's like five or six more questions. And I think Jabba will not be upset with us if we will delay his session a little bit. So let's start with the first question again. All right. Well, I can read. Uh, I can okay. read her question. Oh, no, no, now we're here. Ready they're all right. Uh, Radio Free. Uh, Kiki Christmas. Uh, cartoon channels are charted. Call it on Nino. Cartoon channels are
So my question was about political education and about the fact that very often politicians, and I'm talking about Georgia here, the politicians who play with radicalism, far right, populism, they leave an impression that they don't see the risks that they play with and that they increase those risks for the country. So what would ensure uh, such risks. Uh, I don't know, can we force politicians to have political education? Of course, it's very hard to imagine. But still, I would ask these questions. What would ensure these risks? Uh, would it be you know, support to and somehow facilitation of the political education? And it was not a pressing matter so far, but it's absolutely clear that the politicians that we have on scene very often they don't even know what they do and, and, and what risk they play with. Now the next question. English. I would like to ask you about populism and democracy. It is often argued that the minimal standard of democracy is a necessary condition for the emergence of populist actors. Uh, so in brackets, scholars rarely characterize leaders of authoritarian countries as populist. How would you describe the uh, prospects of populist actors in democratizing countries that are not fully democratic regimes but uh, aspire to become one? Uh, okay, I will uh, read the question of Vidin Lebanese. Thank you for your interesting discussion. Uh, he said, question to Professor Mude, what is the dividing line between being xenophobic and being against the irregular mig migration? Uh, and related to this, uh, would you consider Danish Social Democratic Party who are for strict immigration re refugee policy as xenophobic far-right populist? So, uh, I think that we can stop here. Okay, shall I, I, I will work my way back again. Um, yeah, so the, the, I generally get this question actually about Islamophobia, um, but I can take it for xenophobia too. Like, I mean, what's the, isn't, isn't there a, a reasonable um, opposition to immigration? I mean, there's nothing undemocratic about controlling who lives in your country, let alone who's a citizen. That's actually part of democracy. Um, <clears throat> it is not by definition xenophobic um, to not want to have immigrants, to not allow immigrants. The question is, what is your argument about it? <clears throat> what is it based on? Um, if your argument is pure egocentrism, uh, just money, you don't want to pay for other people, then that has nothing to do with who those people are. Like, if, if you're completely libertarian, you're actually in favor of immigration. But if you just don't want to pay for anyone, that's fine. <clears throat> if you don't want to pay for certain people, right, because you associate them with certain characteristics, for example, that they're lazy, whereas your people are hardworking, then you're xenophobic, then you essentialize other groups. Also, xenophobia is, an, is literally an irrational fear of the other. And there are all kinds of issues that are related to immigration. Right? Um, at the same time, the idea that there is a great replacement, that your population is being replaced by a new immigration by a new population of immigrants is irrational because the numbers don't add this up in any way, shape or form. Uh, if you believe that Muslims want to make a caliphate of Europe, right, again, there is no evidence. There's no empirical evidence. It doesn't mean that there are some Muslims who want that, but if you argue that those some speak for all, you're essentializing a population. That would mean that I look at the Christian fundamentalist around like my state and then say, 
Christians want to do this, right? No, we accept that within Christianity and among Christians, there are all kinds of differences. If we essentialize Islam and Muslims, right, we're Islamophobic. If we essentialize the other and make them into one homogenous block, we're xenophobic. Is the Danish Social Democratic Party really a radical right party? Um, <clears throat> They're a xenophobic party, for sure. Um, I'm not sure whether they are that populist anymore, whether they are authoritarian, um, but they're shifting to it and they're pretty open in it. I mean, they by and large, they, they proudly claimed that they had made <clears throat> the Danish People's Party, which is traditionally the most important radical right party, that they had made them um, irrelevance superfluous like the, the argument was they're no longer needed because we do what they want better right um i didn't fully understand the question about them democracy and populism but <clears throat> i take it to mean as is democracy a necessary condition for populism um not necessarily as a system i think i think it is necessary that a large portion of the population believes in democracy, believes that the people should rule. <clears throat> if you don't believe that, it doesn't make sense to be a populist. Now, of course, there are a lot of countries that have a, an, still an authoritarian regime where the vast majority of people support a democratic ideal. And so you can have populism in authoritarian countries. The political education question was complex, but um, so first of all, this is a question I always have with my students, which is my fun question these days, because students, of course, always believe that education will make all the difference. After all, they're in school, they're getting a degree, and this is pretty self-serving that like that will make you a better uh, person. <clears throat> and my, my example always that kills them is the craziest member of Congress in the US today is a woman called Marjorie Taylor Greene, right, who talks about Jewish space lasers and other kind of things. She has a degree from my university. Right? And my university is a very good university. Right? Josh Hawley, who is one of the, the most dangerous people in the Senate at the moment, has degrees from, I think, either Stanford and Yale or Princeton and Yale, right? Clearly, education is not in and by itself enough. Now, if you merely talk about explaining the risk of what people do, I think you shouldn't direct that at either the real believers, the radical right, or the pure opportunists. They're not going to care, right? what you should direct it to as at those within the mainstream who are thinking about collaborating with the radical right and with the political entrepreneurs. I think it's rather than just saying you should not be in coalition with these people, right? Which might mean that rather than in coalition, they will be in opposition which very few politicians will prefer just to save democracy. What you should explain is you should only go in coalition under your own terms. There should be certain things that you don't compromise on. And these elements like, <clears throat> are elements of the institutions and values of liberal democracy, um, which also means that you, don't, that you don't dehumanize other people, right? It's not just like that you don't abolish oversight of elections. No, it also means that you don't dehumanize people, that you don't dehumanize the opposition, that you don't speak about enemies, right? But if for a conservative party, they can get more done within the framework of liberal democracy with the radical right than with the social Democrats, it makes very little sense for them not to do that. And I think it's too high a bar to expect at the same time, many of them go into a coalition with the radical right, not understanding 
how they are helping to undermine basic values and basic institutions of liberal democracy. And I think that is the task of us to, to point out, like, these are the boundaries, don't move beyond that. I think that's it. Thank you, Professor, for this very interesting conversation. I'm sure that uh, your uh, speech uh, laid the foundation for our second panel, which is mostly about Georgia. I would like to apologize to Jabba for stealing five minutes of his time, and I want to pass floor to him because he's the moderator of the second panel. So thank you, Professor, once again. I'm absolutely sure that if not for this pandemic, we would have seen you here visiting Georgia, and I very much hope that we will be able to accomplish it in the nearest future. So thank you once again, and I now move floor to Java. Good afternoon. And I was thinking, shall I continue in Georgian or English? And yes, in Georgian. So I will present the second panel as a moderator of it. This conversation, the presentation that we had in the first panel was really very interesting uh, because uh, he talked about terminology and uh, definitions uh, and it was said very understandably and quite briefly too. So this reason for me moderating today is that I'm one of the founders of the civil.ge and it is quite relevant, I think, because as a journalist, as an editor-in-chief, I had to, and my colleagues now work, I had to take decisions about what to call the parties, which are radical rights or far rights and what to call them, how to name them and what space to give them um, and what space shall be allocated by the respectable media to parties with such positions, far right positions. Now, and of course, we have to somehow feed it to the Georgian uh, context. Uh, and uh, of course, things that we want to feed to our country is much wider and broader in nature. For me, a very good example uh, for talking about it is this uh, book of Masova, um, The Europe, the Dark Continent, where he describes uh, uh, where, whether. Um, whether these movements were as democratic as uh, say they I would say should have been and uh, today the vision of liberal democracy is associated with europe and this is not comprehensive really and it's not really full um after the world war ii especially So uh, these uh, things that you've discussed, Professor, are very interesting, but it's a little sort of odd uh, for us. This, uh, in time where the rest of Europe uh, fought and won, uh, we were sort of... Uh, uh, we were missing in this, right? And uh, as why one of my um, favorite uh, characters uh, uh, says that is it necessities to do for us something so liberal democracy uh, winning is something that never happened to some somebody else. So how should we see the far right or radical right groups? Uh, and their development and electoral successes. So our key two panelists, Nino Absent and David Sechinava, they will describe the Jordan context.
but before I move forward to them, I want, for the context purposes, I want to share my view and my opinion on this matter. As Professor Moody said, that there are two elements, whether they are mainstream uh, and this uh, far-right ideas, are they the centre of political thinking or not, and also is it normalised or not, and is it perceived as good by the people. So Western Europe and Central Europe, to some extent, are at the stage where where they have first this uh, normalized those trends they became more or less acceptable it, it, it became possible to speak about it and now there is the risk that they become mainstreaming that they will get involved in the normal politics so for countries like georgia for whom um, building liberal democracy is the new experience in general. The circumstances may be quite opposite. So these opinions that uh, are considered as far right, they might have been mainstream initially, but because uh, this uh, country was built in uh, uh, emulation to the liberal democracy, therefore, those opinions were not normalized they were not uh, it was not acceptable to speak about it openly and now it becomes more and more and more acceptable and that actually creates in liberalist thinking people like myself for instance uh, or my colleagues it creates some internal problems so to say or the concern um so if we liberals think that radical right ideas are mainstream, then why do we liberals have to create hindrances to expression of those ideas publicly, or shall we somehow oppose to it or not? So uh, it is sort of the it is an example of uh, uh, or a task of clearly articulating those tasks so where i mean are these political parties or media ready not only to reject or mock these far-right parties or or will they be able to structure their logic so that it is understandable understandable for the people who are in the process of transformation right now so that was my general idea about these things and now i'd like to present our speakers in this panel nino abzianice is the first speaker she has graduated the doctorate degree from the Zurich University and she's been with the Copenhagen and Central European University. Uh, it was the postdoctorate researches that uh, she um, conducted there. So today she's the associate professor of GPA and uh, the communications coordinator of uh, the GIP. I think I'm saying all of this right. And then the second is David Sijina. Many of you know him, and I know him for, for a long time as a researcher. He is an author of many researches in sociology, the person who has many different interests in urbanism and far-right uh, groups, uh, researches. I know his papers and articles quite well, and I think he will to speak to us about not only about how um, how mass media cover the far right groups, which is the topic of Nino's speech, but he will also tell us that these values are internalized uh, and what are the positions prevailing, say, um, radical, how radical or extremist are our far right groups. So the floor is given to Nino now. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for this very interesting discussion. I had a agreement that we have, I have a presentation in English because of our international participants, so let me just share the screen. 
So um, once again, I would like to thank GIP and uh, Open Society Georgia for giving me this opportunity uh, to conduct research on such an interesting topic. Uh, as I have uh, limited time to present, and the paper was quite lengthy, I have to be very um, selective in what I present, so I've focused on some major findings. So the research that I conducted within the framework of this project um, derived from the fact or from the recent trend in rise of far right groups uh, and political parties in Georgia. Um, and we know their political capital is not that strong these days. However, we're also witnessing uh, instances of um, their potential being increased um, time by time, um, from time to time. And maybe the recent example of Levan Vasadze, the major uh, ultra nationalist actor in Georgia, declaring that he's going to establish a political party is the best example here. Um, observers in Georgia have been fearing that exaggerated media attention might be instrumental for these groups to gain momentum and to influence political agenda with their illiberal discourses. Uh, however, there is very um, uh, small or rather no research actually done about these topics, about mass media coverage of these groups in Georgia, and we don't really have a systematic empirical evidence about the, uh, the patterns of media coverage of these groups. Uh, this is why the aim of this paper that uh, I wrote for GIP um, was to actually map the structure of the mainstream media discourse of and around ultranationalist groups in Georgia. And that's where the main, main research question of this uh, study came from. However, to be a little more precise, I will uh, list a few sub-questions that this research has addressed specifically. Um, how much of the ultranationalist narratives penetrate mainstream media discourse? Do the media present counter-arguments of ultranationalists to the public? What is general actor constellation of the media discourse when covering... Uh, um, sorry. Wrong. Um, when covering activities of uh, ultranationalist groups? Who is given the voice and who has a stronger agency in setting the discourse agenda, ultranationalist actors or others? However, when I say, uh, when I'm interested in whether the ultranationalist discourses penetrate media, I obviously need to know what these discourses are. Um, luckily, there has been a research, comprehensive research done by Ketelan Sarkani and Alexander Tsurkawa, uh, who have studied ultranationalist narratives of, on Facebook pages of uh, quite a few of um, ultranationalist groups in Georgia. And they have identified uh, thematic categories which these groups themselves are willing to put up on the discursive agenda. So I based this code book that I uh, used in my own research on their findings because the Facebook, Facebook pages are controlled by these groups, and these are the best places to find out what are actual uh, topics or thematic categories that they want to put on the agenda. I won't go through each, through each of them here. The paper presents the detailed description and definition of each of these categories. But one thing that I wanted to mention here is that um, as, as long as I'm also interested to see whether counter discourses are present in the media, I also code opposite categories to each of them. For example, LGBT as a category would refer to, let's say, condemning LGBT rights, where, whereas LGBT opposite would code instances of, for example, defending LGBT rights. And same is for all the rest of the categories. Additionally, I have added two categories, such as negative and positive references, and violence as a category, which is a broad category, um, uh, including not only, for example, physical injuries, but also damaging something or um, conducting some kind of destructive physical action. Uh, uh, however, um, uh, well, even if we have these categories, uh, thematic categories as such are not the only elements of the discourse, right? Discourse is a broader concept, so it needs, um, it, it involves way more, ele more elements in it than just thematic categories. So based on my previous research of um, nationalist discourse, I uh, approach the ultra-nationalist discourse here as a, a, a semantic construct, which consists of different elements, which are uh, interrelated to each other. 
So central to it is, of course, the content of, um, of the discourse, the thematic categories that I have listed. But apart from it, there are actors involved in it, right? Actors who make statements and actors towards whom the statements are made. And additionally, uh, it also includes context, which I call type of statement. For example, if a thematic category is mentioned, it is important to also code uh, in what context is it mentioned? Is it blaming, protesting, I don't know, calling for, threatening, et cetera? Therefore, the unit of analysis here is uh, a statement that expresses a position, and the collection of the statements is what defines the discourse here. Um, so, uh, as we know, in Georgia, media doesn't really cover ultranationalist groups unless they are active themselves. This is why we, I selected specific cases of uh, the, the activities of these groups, um, which, which resonated particularly strongly. And these cases are Ray Revolution, Felicity Pride of June 2019, the March of Dignity uh, that, was, that followed the Gavrilov's Night in July 2019, and the premiere of the film, and then we danced uh, in November 2019. So for each of these cases, I analyzed the day of the event, so news coverage of the day of the event, and, and the next day. Few coding details. So this analysis covers three uh, mainstream TV channels, Rustavio Imedi TV, Georgian Public Broadcaster. And for each of them, it covers uh, primetime news programs, including the weekend editions. Um, uh, just to give you a brief uh, overview of the data that has been collected uh, under the framework of this, of this research, um, uh, we studied or we, we analyzed 124 new stories in total that resulted in 811 uh, statements coded. I also coded um, minutes that have been allocated to ultranationalist actors as a cumulative measure, and the minutes that have been al uh, allocated to all the other actors. I have to briefly mention here that the paper presents a lengthy discussion, uh, terminological discussion, why I use the term ultranationalist and not, for example, fascists or Nazis, However, this 15 minutes that I'm given uh, is not enough to go into these details. I'm, I will be very happy to, to discuss this in the Q&A session. Uh, so um, in, in, from this table, from the, um, at one side, you, you see that in general, minutes time allocated to internationalist actors is way less to all the other actors. However, all the other actors is quite a broad Term. So we need to go into a bit of, a, you know, into deeper discursive structures to see what is actually happening in the discourse. And uh, with this aim in mind, I have um, used uh, the method of social network analysis in order to map this discourse. Um, and the re another reason to it is also that the, the data is, has a quite a relational nature, right? So what you see on the screen right now is it is a thematic discourse network um, that is present in the media coverage of ultranationalist groups. And um, uh, to read this network, you should know that uh, nodes, so-called nodes, these little balls that are present uh, on the picture, um, represent two sets of information. So one set of nodes are actors, and these are the ones represented in black labels or with black letters. And the second set of nodes are the thematic concepts to which these actors refer to. And these are represented in uh, red labels, right? Um, so the bigger the uh, node is and the closer it is to the center, the more dominant it is in the discourse. Uh, and these arrows uh, represent uh, how intensively certain actors refer to, give, to the given uh, thematic category. So what you can see is that the discourse um, that we have studied is um, dominated strongly by negative references, uh, representing the center of the, uh, of the graph, right? Uh, and the second most uh, referred category is violence and no violence. At one side, you can say that violence and no violence might be balancing each other, but um, even the talk of no violence shows that the violence as a category is the center of the discourse in the Georgian media when it comes to the covering of ultranationalism. Maybe also other topics as well, but at least what we have studied here, it's, uh, it seems that negative references and violence, so talks of violence is what, what, defi or what, what forms the center of the discourse on this topic. Uh, interestingly, um, all the substantial topics, and by substantial topics, I mean those thematic categories that these groups want to push themselves, 
they are very marginal. There's only one topic that is relatively closer to the center that is LGBT. And even that one is present in the form of ultranationalist narratives, whereas LGBT opposite category is on the very margin, almost not even mentioned in the discourse. Uh, there is slight, slight uh, presence of the topic of drug policy, both in the form of ultranationalist narrative and in the form of liberalizing drug policy. You can see it in the lower part of the graph. However, it's very, um, it is still marginal uh, compared to the negative references and uh, talks of violence. Now, there are good reasons to think that um, maybe across different TV channels, the picture changes uh, as different channels might have different agendas. However, what we see on this graph uh, is that even if we compare different TV channels to each other, um, the general picture doesn't change. So negative references and violence still define the discourse when it comes to the covering um, of this groups, activities and discourses of these groups. Um, there are differences here uh, in the extent to which uh, negative references and viol talks of violence are uh, dominant in the, uh, on, on a specific channel. For example, in the case of Rustavi Ori, uh, negative references and violence have way more, uh, or the share of this uh, thematic categories in the discourse is bigger than on the other TV channels. However, general picture stays robust, right? So um, uh, another important thing, uh, now, now that we know this kind of structures, um, it is also important to look at in what context these categories are mentioned. Now, this is what the graph on the slide does here. Uh, instead of actors here, the second set of nodes are represented by uh, the variable type of statement. So we have this um, uh, thematic categories and we want to see in what context they are mentioned. And again, the size of the, the node refers uh, to, the, to its centrality and the width of the arrows shows how intensive, intensively a context is related to a specific category. And what we and this one doesn't include negative and positive references because the, these two variables were not coded in relation to this uh, type of statement as they are actor level variables. So what we see here is that the major topic of this discourse is blaming each other for violence. You see the size and of the arrow here, right? Uh, when it comes to no violence, um, it is promised, it is called for, it is supported, also protested, but interestingly, it's also condemned sometimes. And uh, it's a bit confusing maybe, but um, when I looked into it deeper, uh, there are these cases where, for example, uh, ultranationalist activists uh, condemn the fact that police doesn't let them in the cinema to switch off the movie, uh, um, the show, for example. And these are the types of um, instances um, why condemning no violence um, is showing up on this graph. Uh, furthermore, this LG uh, LGBT topic is um, time. Yeah, that would be nice. How much time do I have? Oh, wasn't I supposed to have 15 minutes? Uh, Okay, I have to rush through this then, and maybe I, I um, jump over this graph. If you are interested, you can see it in the um, in the paper, and I will directly jump to the actor part of it. So another uh, angle to look at this discourse is who are the dominant actors, and what you see here is um, that most of the discourse is dominated by journalists. So journalists are the ones who make most statements. And I remind you, these are the positions expressed here. Uh, and beyond journalists, second most active actors are ultranationalist leaders and ultranationalist activists who are, whose voice we hear when, cover, when media covers these topics, right? Uh, interestingly, church is also part of the, uh, of the uh, active discourse. And one interesting part, um, picture here is that we don't see representatives of government uh, or political parties being dominating uh, the discourse. It seems like media is mostly interested in the actors who are on the front lines of the conflict, because the cases that have been analyzed are the ones that are conflict between ultranationalist activists and the activists on the liberal side, which you also see in the center of the, uh, yeah, relatively in the center of the discourse. I tried to do a robustness check here, but I don't think I have time for this robust to present the robustness check. Uh, I would, would like to uh, show you the comparison across different channels. 
interestingly, Rustavi Ori is the one who drives the journalistic center of the discourse because it seems like journalists, journalists on Rustavi Ori are the ones who are particularly active in making statements, whereas on the other two channels, we see that ultranationalist activists are um, are in the center of the discourse. Um, interestingly, Georgian public broadcaster, uh, discourse on the uh, Georgian public broadcaster has way diverse uh, set of actors present in it compared to other two channels. Now, as I don't have much time, I will rush to the concluding remarks just to, to, to tell like, so what, like what does this whole story tells us? First of all, it tells us that ultranationalist groups in Georgia are not very successful in pursuing their thematic agenda in the mass media because their thematic uh, categories are not picked up by media. Uh, major thematic issues uh, uh, are marginal, as I said. Um, and however, ultranationalist actors, um, their leaders and church are among the most central actors whose voice are heard in the media coverage of the selected cases. Most of the discursive space in the media under the study is taken by negative references, insults, offensive language, or talking about violence. And last but not least, journalists themselves appear to be actively expressing their own positions while covering the events under focus. By that, accentuating negativity and violence as the major frames of reporting, which of course reinforces, um, sorry, reinforces these categories on the agenda. I was asked to bring up certain solutions to this situation, but as I'm out of time, I will be happy to talk about this in the Q&A session if, if there is an interest in this. Thank you very much. I'll stop here. It was a very interesting presentation and very interesting paper. And I, of course, advise everybody to get acquainted with it and see what are the link, links between the discourses, etc. I just wanted to ask, and we see it clearly, that the topic of violence is central, actually, that actually consolidates and un unites uh, um, all media because they are all covering it, you know, violence or no violence, it is all united in one discourse. So what's the explanation for that so, for you? So violence is a radical uh, right or radicalism in general. So what is it? And maybe David wanted uh, or has something to say about it too. Well, I think that the issue of uh, violence goes beyond uh, that ultranationalistic groups in Georgia and to what media does, I would call it this is the, you know, this systematic problem because everything is viewed uh, from the point of view of violence. And we empirically have seen that some issues um, basically disappeared from scene, I'd say. Uh, and so the only thing that it is reviewed, it's violence. So here you've seen diagrams, but we're listening to all of this, right? And there we see that nothing but violence uh, is discussed by media. I don't know what's the explanation. Maybe it's just that the sensational journalists, just, you know, the willingness to attract uh, viewers. Uh, I mean, it's generally is the rule, but here especially, that if they talk about violence, the risks, threats, etc., that would attract more viewers, which in itself uh, makes uh, makes more important these actors so when media shows them and depicts them from this point of view i think we've touched upon a very important issue and in social pools it is quite visible too that uh, the manipulation uh, uh, with fear to create this sensation and, and building a gender uh, by that is quite characteristic for media, and not only, and this is probably the language that, um, you know, far right or ultra nationalistic groups, that they know this language.
language very well. So uh, when journalists use this language, it somehow broadens uh, their presence in on TV. Although the specific uh, topics, uh, uh, they are not very broad and wide on agenda anyhow. And I think this is a very good element um, for thinking about the future and future solutions as well. I just wanted to add that in different media we have, although the media is different, we have a lot of similarities uh, between them. And uh, basically media, you know, underline and focus on violence, etc. Deepening this fear and manipulation with fear is also one of the methods probably that is used by radical groups and they are trying to uh, voice out their statements and make themselves more visible and more, so to say, um, actual uh, sort of Although they were not very successful so far, but who knows what is going to happen in the future. Um, because of our format, let's complete the presentations uh, uh, so that we do not confuse our participants. Of course, I understand the questions of the moderator, uh, but uh, we want to to uh, to really clearly indicate the participants where we have the Q and A uh, session. So, all right, then I will move floor to David. He will talk to us about the research that he has conducted. I think it's a very good segue uh, from the conversation we just had. So what uh, uh, Georgians think about the far right thematics, what are the correlations between these groups and what are the topics that they want to bring up front? Thank you. I want to share my screen first of all. I will speak Georgian, although the slides are prepared in English. So, um, David Kishneva, uh, the head of uh, Georgian researches, and I want to speak about one of the researches that uh, have been conducted and done approximately two years ago. And that was about the social networks and activism of far right groups in the Georgian social media. And it was research about their discourses. Briefly about this, what I'm going to speak about, what we did with study, we'll speak about the results, uh, we'll give a description of what were the results, the findings and many of you may know this already. I want to mention them in a broader context. We have approximately 70 groups that we've observed and studied. And uh, these are pages that were built by outsourcing uh, uh, they were media pages and many such page uh, of such pages do not exist anymore because the Facebook from time to time you know closes them down or uh, abolishes them so we uh, luckily have the historic data that we have analyzed we've used the different uh, topic modeling and sentiment analysis and it allowed us to see the correlation between these uh, Facebook pages and on the other hand the sentiment analysis allowed us to see how they talk about this is their topic and of course, this topic modeling or the text, the topic modeling was also used. And this is the data between 2015 and 2019. First of all, I want to say that the activity of such pages was increasing of a certain period of time. 
and uh, that basically measures how we measured it by the number of posts published on such pages. Um, uh, and probably the increase was related to the fact that there were many pages like that created in the recent uh, time and uh, more people also had access to internet etc and therefore these pages became more accessible and uh, the increase of activities we can say that was not directly linked to the increase of the or in audience or the interest of the audience and we have this, this, this stable audience there although we have some peaks as well in terms of creation of posts uh, as well as in terms of interaction with the audience and we have seen that the biggest number of posts in this group and the most active week was between june 3 to 10 in 2018 and that was related as we realized it later uh, that it was related to this necessarily this son's murder um, we can allocate certain groups that uh, shared uh, more or less similar content uh, we also had this uh, um, this uh, TV, which is called uh, the lens of the objective. It is called in Georgia, and uh, it was also uh, the the owners of the that uh, were in the political party, and also we see three other large clusters where social media pages uh, share similar content and then they are uh, correlated so even it may indicate it's some sort of coordination and if not the coordination but the fact that they share the same values or ideas so this is the analysis that we see and uh, So here we have the, this, uh, the analysis of um, texts and posts like that. So this is what we analyze. And we, by modeling, we are trying to uh, uh, calculate or identify what the topics are. So here we see uh, the if not the calls for violence, but the violence is present in these topics. And also, it's about, it's about the LGBTQ uh, groups. There are topics that were about the event unfolding in the Bankisi Gorge when we had some protests there and was related to hydropower stations, etc. And there were pages who were sharing more of some religious content. And we can also see the change in some time frames. So we can look at the most popular pages and you see here, uh, he, see here that all these pages have their own uh, niches like the uh, fight, fighters or nationalism. Uh, there, there are pages that talk about it. This is a page at Boba uh, and uh, others. And there are pages.
Uh, so there are different uh, 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 themes and they have their own niches and also in the context, uh, you know, they, they were reviewing quite interesting issues like the issues of David Gerechi, this uh, board uh, um, conflict and arguments, which is related to the huge monastery complex on the border with Azerbaijan and uh, uh, other issues where they tried to uh, spread their opinions about the matter in question and uh, they would use uh, um, specific terms to uh, to towards their We have seen various pictures like Zucker, which is the Azeri company, and it was called for not using uh, Azeri products or oil or gas, etc. And also, the important thing is that many groups are not anti Islamic or anti Turkey in general, uh, though. Uh, that this is like they are trying to create like cartographic concerns, say, where they show the examples of uh, territories uh, that uh, will belong to um, belong to Georgia like centuries ago. Um, and uh, these groups, they are trying to somehow follow closely this topic, uh, like. Okay. In June of 2019, and uh, they uh, would speak about the uh, New Zealand uh, um, terroristic acts, uh, etc. And uh, the last topic, and I think I will uh, finish my presentation soon. And uh, the interesting thing is that if we look at uh, these discourses from the point of view international relations, it's not necessarily that they are pro-Russian, uh, say, or that they are disseminating pro-Russian content, uh, many of them are trying to, quite opposite, to speak in a very negative context about Russia and about the West and the Western world. There are only several pages which are clearly pro-Russian and speaking in a very positive key about Russia. and. Um, They use their terms, their vocabulary, so to say. And in both cases, they use the word, the vocabulary that is absolutely uh, clearly characterizing Russia as the enemies. So this is what I wanted to tell you briefly. Maybe I went beyond some uh, some some time frames, but uh, I'm ready to contribute during the uh, discussion. Thank you, Dave. It. You've presented various elements, and probably it continues the topic that uh, we uh, discussed in the first panel, meaning that where is the boundary, where is the line between the uh, uh, radical rights and the the others, so liberal or non-liberal governance forms, what, where is this line between these two, etc. And whether it is the same or not. So. It may be one of the issues that we will discuss in the end of our meeting. And so Selika Tuladze will lead it. Uh, she is the executive director of the Social Research Center, and we will ask her to summarize these talks of the second panel and maybe she will echo the, uh, the the first panel and then we will open up floor for questions. I will probably speak Jordan as well, so it doesn't matter, just, uh, you know. Yes, please speak Jordan. All right, first of all, thank you to 
to Nino and David for this wonderful researches and for their presentations because they are really very timely and very pressing. Uh, that much pressing that we recently received the EU project and I know what are the projects uh, funded so actively under the same umbrella by the EU. Uh, we've started our ongoing research in March and it will this project will continue for another four years. It is not exactly the same topic, but it covers. And this is seeing the the uh, limits of Horizon 2020, and I'm happy to be sort of the author of that. We have uh, six partners from the EU countries, and it and it is called the. Um, in the name of the project and uh, because we're talking about europeanization in european context therefore you know anti-european anti-western uh, propaganda of course uh, matters a lot and uh, uh, and it propagates based on nationalistic sentiments and usually it is done by uh, such media actors. We can do desk research, but we start the media analysis uh, very soon. The uh, mainstream ultra-nationalist uh, media will see how this discourse will unfold and develop. And I think Innes and David's researches will be used as well. We understand that they have more of a structural analysis and we need the in-depth discourse analysis. And Nino is invited to participate in our research, she will be with us. For one. <laughs> who is famous for the book Politics of Fear, which was published in 2015, and Britain, and another author with this uh, analysis. There's a Dutch author who worked for years in Spain, Toen van Dijk, uh, with this uh, discourse of analyzing racism in media, in press, who starts, he was, he was the first who start analyzing this discourse in press uh, and uh, who has uh, his ideological um, framework and so we can actually uh, look at analyze this sort of nationalistic discourse. Now, I think that uh, to better understand ultra nationalist uh, discourse in media, and I want to use an example the recent research of. in the journal Politics. The name is, is Populist Media and Mainstream of the Right. And that became the foundation or the background for the next book that was recently presented. I will try to very briefly outline my position. So they review three trends where the media tries to mainstream this uh, far right ultra nationalism and uh, and it is sort of uh, uh, hidden uh, under the curtain of populism and say and so uh, this is how it is sort of masked or that's a disguise that they use of course, I will not be able to speak about all the details, but they call it the deflection and agenda setting hour. And they are talking about the media media agents, uh, uh, which try to avoid responsibility from themselves. And again, shifting it, uh, this responsibility towards the public, towards the people, so that the people um, shall see and digest all of that themselves, that I as media judge 
thing is that euphemisms and idealization that is used. Very often it happens that uh, this radical nationalist uh, far right, these terms are substituted by nicer terms and this is how it is presented to people so that they are more sort of naturalized, naturalized and then uh, somehow this is shown in the populism, uh, populism direction and then uh, as Marily Penn said that if you show me from the populism point of view and show me as the person who stands close to people then yes I'm a populist and there are things uh, there is third one the simplifications and our first speaker certainly uh, big focus on ultra nationalism and uh, uh, allocating quite a lot of TV time uh, for even very insignificant people who would have not become known to us otherwise. And uh, sort of it's naturalization or mainstreaming them uh, and somehow legitimizing them too. And here we see the problem that with this legitimizing of them, and somebody, a, a, among panelists, has also mentioned that, uh, that they themselves do not expect the negative results that it may lead to. And this is how it usually happens. So I will complete in two minutes. I think I have two minutes. Thank you. So uh, we work on Europeanization for more than 10 years and political Uh, this is published on the CCG and you can download it from the website. The, the book that was published in 2016 is also there. And so from these papers, we can see that this course is related to representation, uh, like uh, identity factors and popular factors. Uh, and um, these are the best uh, uh, methods for creating somehow and raising these nationalistic uh, sentiments and that's what they do and they use it. Uh, the 2018-2020 research showed that this national identity fears that were actively expressed um, and we had it from politicians as well but it was absolutely evident in media and showed that the uh, you know the, the, the family traditions the, the church uh, uh, they thought somehow showed that this e Europe and Europeanization was the threat so uh, currently our nationalistic sentiments are brought to this identity and now how they use this that EU spreads homosexualism, that uh, they just did the EU and your position just brainwashes the people and anti discrimination law is against completely the Georgian traditions and identity, etc. etc. 2014 up to now, uh, this number of such discourses is uh, calculated and we see that these discourses related to homosexualism increased and it is dominant now. And the paradox is that uh, you know, we would, would somebody would think that this homosexualism would be the discourse of of church, but it is not so. If we look at the Media Development Fund uh, researches, we would see that uh, the same number of discourses are offered by the churches and church representatives, and also uh, we can say that such discourses are offered by the mainstream politicians and such offerings are increased four to seven times actually so 
and these these courses became very frequent i think we have to pay attention to it and in the same context i would say and this is my last sentence i understand that we don't have more time but uh, in this uh, content these uh, three strategies and which were for which this the fear politics are you know so spread one is to really intimidate people another is that the uh, creating this hopelessness uh, that this is the end there is no any future there is no any perspective and the solution is some sort of a third strategy uh, some sort of salvation if you will uh, and this is usually the Salvation is the ethnic nationalism, and another, like David said, that uh, some marginalized and uh, Russia is always viewed uh, in a positive key as you know the, the country with the, the same uh, religion, uh, sort of the friend, etc., um, and uh, uh, which is uh, absolutely against. Um, So we see these discourses, and it is absolutely necessary to uh, to learn and start these issues. In we develop, we grow, and increase awareness of the public. So here I will stop and thank you to all of you, to organizers, participants, and I would like to thank. Uh, that is so necessary. Now, I think we will open the floor to our panel. I see several hands raised already. And uh, it is quite interesting to see that there are leading topics uh, and um, we know that there are some sort of waves, right? I say of these topics when it was now it's a sexual minorities and uh, those are very unpleasant associations uh, because you know this is one of the examples of uh, the of this uh, policies I don't know maybe because you know whoever pays the uh, so to say all this all this music or maybe it's something else but uh, uh, this media somehow exchange the uh, media so it would be good to do the comparative analysis in other countries too so i will open up the floor for questions right i hope you hear me well, I have a question to both Nino and David. Where, when you've analyzed these discourses in media, well, at least from the presentations I didn't see, but what's your personal observation and idea? Maybe say we have the parliamentary force, the right act like the parents and these discourses say in media and in the parliament from the from the parliament or elsewhere in social networks etc are they any different or the, do they become uh, similar to um, to the to, to each other etc so uh, so did you observe something like that in your researches or not in your studies? Yes, please answer. I brought up one slide that I couldn't go through the present uh, during the presentation. So in my research, 
the time that my research covers then the Patriots, uh, Patriots Alliance was in the parliament and you can see probably then this net that ultranationalist activists and leaders, they are very close to church and they are somewhere in the center of this, of this web. And around them we see the topics that the three actors discuss uh, or use in their statements. This is why the three actors are located together. And if you look a little bit up, uh, you will see that the Alliance of Patriots is very close to them in their discourse and statements just slightly slightly different so ultra nationalist uh, activists church and leaders their discourse is closer to each other than this parliamentary party which was in the parliament at that point of time so it is like slightly different in topics that they offer the audience. So uh, as to the Parliament's Tribune, I don't have an answer to it. Well, I can share my observation. If we look at the social media and social media analysis, the Alliance of Patriots, their media wing, this TV, uh, object TV was sort of separate rather than we look uh, at the cluster analysis uh, and uh, in fact topically and thematically they're also trying to occupy their own niche in this ultranationalist discourse but their main uh, arsenal is uh, to, to Turkophobia, Islamophobia, I would say, and it was so it's to their, their, their um, arms and arsenals that they used in their um, uh, last elections, uh, like the majoritarian pool that was the territory where the Alliance of Patriots um, have gained the biggest number of uh, Boats versus other uh, polling stations and their activities uh, um, uh, in elections, in local elections in Adjara, um, also indicates that they are trying to occupy that niche. Islamophobic and phobia for Turkey. Thank you. Shota Kagabadze has a question. Thank you indeed for this interesting presentation. I have the question for all three of you actually. From your research, and when you conducted your research, have you encountered uh, any opinion about attitude of this group to the Soviet past and or what was their attitude to the first republic? Was were they more positive about that and negative about this Russian occupation? Or not? It's a very interesting question. Kyurgi Guksadze also asked a question for Liga Tulatze about the name of the book that maybe you could repeat and the, the second is this question from Nina Gozeshwis. Thank you for this presentation. According to my observations uh, and the presentation speak about it, these populist powers, uh, they very often speak about uh, Poland, uh, they use the references Poland, Hungary and America. So. Uh, So how does it affect the Europeanization or anti-Europeanization uh, uh, discourses? And I also want to add one thing, and that was a request uh, for our speakers. And Dina wanted to talk about it. Could you please speak about some solutions? So how can media be um, 
uh, subjective as possible or what are the prevention mechanisms uh, so that uh, the false information at least is not disseminated. If you give me the right to share my files, I can send the book itself and the two articles into chat. And all of them are published about two, three months ago. Thank you. You can already send it to our chat. You are a co-host and basically you have almost all the rights and if not we can email it to our participants later if you are unable to to share it now okay now the first question about the soviet context i will mainly say that i have no answer that's and that's my answer uh, so the research that uh, I based my research on this we see that on Facebook pages this topic appearing and reappearing so we talked about the authoritarianism uh, because it's like you know people usually say that we need this talent um, steel hand etc but as you've seen from these diagrams uh, in media these topics do not appear they don't talk about it uh, uh, they don't talk about other issues issues that are the topic of concern for those groups. <laughs> it is an interesting issue indeed and probably we probably have to have an assumption uh, for groups that we have analysed of course and so this selection bias will be there of course uh, they, because they are not homogenous groups uh, and I can bring a small example we looked at um, the May 9th and the texts that were disseminated on May 9th and what we've seen was absolutely different and diverse just like groups and the groups the which promotes the fasci ideology is there reaction to may 9th it was quite negative i will just read the quote one page posted something like that yes it's true that this uh, communists uh, won this censorship but they uh, couldn't win over the national socialists you may win the war but not abolish or eliminate the idea itself so it's absolutely soviet attitude as we can clearly see from this quote and also some this issue of May 9th and this day of victory was something else and uh, uh, yeah that is a cause of another group that this because uh, Soviet governing was uh, absolutely disastrous but the fascism would have been even worse and more irreversible than than the Soviet Union so there are different attitudes to Soviet uh, times to um, Russia etc so Western liberal democratic uh, uh, concepts yes they don't like it but at the same time you know uh, the Soviet time, this um, as an alternative, this is quite an acceptable thing to them. I think this question was asked for me too, so let me answer as well. In the recent, in the last research, we didn't analyze media, but before that, we had four waves of analyzing media. And I want to tell you that Soviet nostalgia uh, was. Uh, 
visible. Uh, of course, you know, it differs by age groups. We mainly had this from 18 to 25 and then from 41 above. Uh, from 18 to 25, of course, there was not Soviet nostalgia, uh, but in the age group of 41 and above, we've seen that, although it is quite easy to explain. And they were mainly people who lived in uh, Abkhazia um, uh, or on the border for occupied Abkhazia and Ossetia. And uh, uh, because they are people mostly affected by this occupation, borderization, and although they should have had this negative attitude, but they would use economic arguments that the borders were open, that we could trade uh, freely, that we could live well, and now we cannot even sell the apples uh, uh, from our uh, orchards, etc. So they were the sentiment. So this is the category of people between 41 to 65 years old. And these were people again living in the, uh, this occupied Abkhazian city bordering um, and adjacent territories. Now, we've also analyzed the media, and media, and there were two media channels that were absolutely nostalgic about Soviet. That was Georgia and the world and uh, the newspaper Asaval the Savali. And uh, the TVs, you know, they do not dare really to speak and to provide the statement so openly um, for obvious reason that it's not popular, but this too, they openly speak about it all. I want to add, since uh, uh, Salome asked me to speak about solutions, uh, I of course do not have the ready-made recipes, but I have certain advice or recommendations that I can see from the researches that I have conducted. And it's just three things. One, I think that it is very important for journalists and for media to work and to increase their own awareness and decrease awareness about these particular topics. Uh, far right or radical right is not only the Georgian phenomenon, and somehow we have this impression that it's only our unique phenomenon, uh, and so there is no, no knowledge beyond this Georgian phenomenon. So they have to learn more about the far right, uh, uh, the radicalism, uh, the reasons, and another advice, it is very important for journalists to understand and realize what results their work can bring in terms of democracy. They walk a very thin line, of course. Especially when we say the basis, we do have segment of people who think like that, and so these people should be visible in media, and also it damages the liberal democracy. Uh, the, the discourses like that, and media have to realize that their role is absolutely crucial in the whole process and therefore the outcomes of that will be quite tangible and it will depend uh, on how successful those powers or forces will be. And number three, advice. Nobody will be able to advise media. Uh, I think some internal professional discussions will be required and they themselves have to talk amongst themselves and unions. It's about what the idea could do not to damage liberal um, democratic processes. And the very last thing that I want to add as the president of the civil society, that the civil society itself shall be more involved with media and media, the journalists, so that all the things that I've listed above, that they help media with, with that. This is all I wanted. Thank you all very much. I don't see any
Any further questions? Possible now to close our meeting today. Uh, first of all, I'm very happy that there are so many researches conducted in this uh, area, and I hope that uh, the, this uh, cross-cutting analysis will be conducted too, uh, so that we know what is this rights um, discourse and so what is the uh, what is this uh, what what sees the part it off and uh, not so that uh, so that we don't discuss it like in a separate phenomenon because the research of these uh, values it indicates how dominant such perception are. so uh, we not only have to look at the groups that are more or less successful in terms of elections, but also about some key trends and the perception of those. And we need to work on those. And if we don't, then somebody else will be there, of course, and it may bring us to some negative results. So I would like to thank you here all and we'll stop. Thank you, dear Jabba, for moderating the, this panel. I'd like to thank all our speakers, Nino and David and Lika, for their summaries. This is actually the concluding conference of our project. And uh, you can find on our website all the publications the experts blogs that we shared in chat as well and we will also share the video that will become available very soon so thank you all very much and i hope that it will not be the end of working on this topic we are quite active in other projects too so hopefully we'll have very interesting researches and findings in the future as well and this job stands that maybe we'll be able to do consolidated analysis of all of it so thank you all very much and i think goodbye to you and i wish you all success